I'm here to tell you when school psychs thrive, kids thrive, communities thrive. Baby psych. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. My name is Tiffany. I am a school psychology intern this year and today I have an amazing guest with me. She is a celebrity in her field and we're going to talk about her journey and then some of her passions. So I am going to go ahead and let her introduce herself. When you say celebrity, it makes me laugh because um, I went to NASP um, in Baltimore and people were like, hey, can I get a selfie with you? And I'm like, well, congratulations, you've met an F-list celebrity, right? Uh, um, so I appreciate that warm introduction um, and I'm really happy to be here. I love chatting with new school psychologists, seasoned school psychologists. I never say old school psychologists, um, but I'm just so happy to be connecting with you today and chatting and geeking out on all things school psych. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Like, this is amazing. Um, so I always start off by asking, you know, whoever I interview, how did you find the field of school psychology and what drew you to it? So it's actually a really interesting story. Um, I was pulled into the field of school psychology by a gypsy. Now, I know that sounds weird, <laughs> but it's a 100% true story. So when I was in uh, college, I was presenting at a conference um, in Reno um, on a, you know one of those research papers that you know people do try to get into grad school, and I was not old enough to go to the bars, and so I went to this restaurant that happened to be one of those European uh, European style seating where like you just sit with everybody, and you know so I was by myself, so I sat next to this woman. And she was a school psychologist, and her name, I kid you not, was Gypsy. And so Gypsy started telling me about, she's like, oh, are you here for the conference? I'm like, yeah, I am. And she, I was like, what do you do? And she's like, I'm a school psychologist. I'm like, tell me more. I've never heard of that. I was fully prepared to go into clinical psychology, have a private practice. And then this Gypsy just lured me straight into school psychology, and I was like, wait a minute. This sounds amazing. Because when I first went to college, I wanted to be a teacher, and then I got drawn into the psychology world, and I was like, that's amazing. And then Gypsy was telling me about all these things, and I was like, oh my gosh, school psychology is if like a teacher and a psychologist had a baby. Like, this is my, this is, how did I not know this existed? So I have uh, Gypsy to thank for bringing me into the world of school psychology, and I've never looked back. That's an awesome story. And the rest is history, right? <laughs> The rest is history. Um, you know, I've been really fortunate. I have loved, I've always loved writing. And so I'm one of those people who I've just started writing into like what was the very, very, I mean, you may or may not have even been born yet. Like I'm not sure. <laughs> no, you were born. But like it was the first blog ever. It was called Blogspot. And I was just writing into like nowhere my thoughts and musings about school psychology. And um, it was in the wild, wild west of uh, the internet and uh, organic reach. And I just grew this community of folks on Facebook and through my blog. And I've been able to, ever since then, have this really strong connection to school psychologists all across the country. And I just love it because... We are a diverse group of folks, but we have so much in common and we can learn so much from each other. So I have really enjoyed my journey, which started out from a gypsy, luring me into the field to being a school psychologist and then blogging about it. And then that's opened up, you know, really a large world of being able to connect to school psychologists across the country. You know, I always say there's so many terrible things about the internet, but I think the one amazing thing is like community and like just meeting so many different people. And I think, you know, these days a lot of people use Instagram or YouTube and they get to build that kind of community. But that's that's really amazing that you got to do that, um, you know, from from the beginning. Yeah. And it's actually um, an interesting story about my first book, which um, I don't know if you've used in, uh, you're in uh, internship year, you say? Yep. And it was required reading for um, our class. <laughs> so we were talking before this broadcast and I did promise I would um, sing my baby psych song <laughs> because you said you were just a baby psych. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> She's ready. Okay. <clears throat> me, 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 me. No. <laughs> Uh, so, baby psych, you're welcome for that earworm. 
So you're a baby psych. <laughs> and um, many young school psychologists get my first book, which is the um, School Psychologist Survival Guide. And it's required reading and stuff. And the funny story about that book, how it came to be, is I wrote the book that I wanted, like that did not exist, essentially. When I started out my internship, it was, we can't curse on this program, I presume, but like, it was a very interesting year <laughs> um, and very difficult and it's surpri in surprising ways. And so that book was really like a culmination of me search. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, we talk about the research behind burnout prevention and um, I took like one class, one afternoon, read one article about burnout. And I was like, well, I'm kind of going to be immune to that because I'm super positive and um, I'm really super organized. I have mad executive functioning skills. I can, I can handle this. And my first year as a school psychologist was really hard. And to say that even lightly is like, I can't even, like I nearly didn't make it <laughs> because there were so many unwritten rules about working in a bureaucracy that I didn't know um, and I was ill-prepared for. So the book that you've all read as interns and graduates is really the culmination of um, what I wish I'd known starting out. Yeah, that's awesome. And we will definitely get to that topic. But um, I guess before getting there, can you describe your typical day as a school psychologist? Well, if you had asked me just a couple of years ago, it would have been a completely different answer. So just even a couple of years ago, um, a lot of my role was doing testing and writing reports and um, repeat, rinse and repeat. And um, my role has evolved a lot. And in every district I've been in, it's been very, very different. And I sort of started out my career chasing the perfect district. Um, if I just move districts, then things are going to be what I want them to be. And what I wanted them to be, what I fantasized about them, is to have my own little office and I would do social emotional learning and a little testing and consulting. And first off, I didn't have an office. I had a clothis at best and sometimes not even that. And it was really challenging because I knew I had many, many skills to offer and I was kind of being relegated to only testing. So I have over the course of, and I've been in the field for about 20 years now. So over the course of those 20 years, I've worked out a way to create the days that I wanted, that I wake up and I'm like, T-G-I-M. <laughs> I get to do what I want to do as a school psychologist. So actually now I've moved from, just in the very recent um, past, I've moved from being a school psychologist at a school to being a trainer of school psychologists, doing professional development, doing things like this, um, working with districts across the country to help free up school psychologists from being testing machines, from being shackled to their laptops, from being... Um, you know, report writing machines, because that's something that I personally have gone through this journey on how to, you know, this fantasy of what school psych was going to be like, then hitting the reality, um, and then cultivating a system to um, make it what I wanted it to be. And now I do all teaching and all professional developments. And I, and I love my life because I just get to geek out all day long with helping school psychologists be pioneers, thought leaders, advocates for what we all know this profession can be, which is far more than testing. And look, I love testing. I love to geek out and percentiles and putting the puzzle pieces together. And many of us love assessment, but that's not the only thing I love. So my typical day is now doing um, trainings with school psychologists, connecting with district leaders, um, and I have actually fun fact, I've been zooming before it was cool. <laughs> before really? Zoom was a verb. <laughs> um, in 2017, I created the Thriving School Psychologist Collective, which is an online course and community. And we had Zoom meetings already for years, um, meeting and connecting with each other so that we could be thought partners, 
problem solvers and um, put our heads together about how we can make this profession what we all know it can be. That's awesome. Um, so were you doing some of this work with a full-time job? I was. <laughs> um, and I was also momming so hard too. I had um, my daughter and actually a lot of this um, movement in my career. And by the way, if you're a newbie out there, you're a um, a baby psych do, 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 do. that's the gif you're going to use okay um, <laughs> for this promo <laughs> if you're new the great thing about school psychology is that you can actually expand your role in many different ways this is just one way that I've expanded it which is you know sharing connecting teaching and doing professional development with other school psychologists because there was something that I wanted and needed and craved and that didn't exist in the way I wanted it to um, but as a newbie, you may think, you know, oh, maybe it's just testing or maybe it's doing social emotional. No, there's a whole world of wonderful things you can do as a school psychologist to be a school leader. Um, but anyway, um, one of the, uh, the trajectory was that I was a school psychologist for about 10 or so years and I got pregnant with my first daughter and I was working in a role that was primarily just testing and, I honestly thought that there was something wrong with me. Like I just needed to get more efficient. But I couldn't keep up and that was all I was doing. And I was on going on maternity leave. And just one day, if anyone's seen my webinars, they know this story or read my book. One day I was in the district office after work trying to finish up reports. And I'm pregnant, six months pregnant. And there was... Um, and it was the worst <laughs> district office you've ever been. It's like out of central casting for like worst, like depressing building with like, I mean, they all but had bars on the windows. Like it was not a nice place to be. Um, but anyhow, um, an intruder came on campus with a gun and we had the lockdown and I'm under the desk holding my belly being like, what am I doing? Like, I'm not only like, I have so much stress and now it's my baby's stress because, and what for what? For writing reports? Like, that's not what I signed up for. I wanted to help kids before they failed. I want to do interventions. I want to form an executive functioning club with my students. I want to do all these things, and I'm bogged down. So I thought I was going to have to quit, honestly. And I'm driving home, and I'm bawling, and hormones too, and stress. And, all that. and I told my husband, like, I don't know what we're going to do. Like, I can't be a school psychologist anymore. I love my students, but I don't love the paperwork. And and that was the week, actually, that Josie Bass Publishers called and like, we love your blog. Would you like to write a book called Thriving Schools? Or it's called The School Psychologist Survival Guide. And I was like, well, that's super ironic, right? Um, but I did end up doing all of that me search. What does it take to be efficient? What does it take to prevent burnout? What does it take to expand your role beyond testing? How can we do MTSS in strapped school systems. Our kids' needs are going up and our resources are going down. What can actually be done? And so that was actually a big turning point. And I started to kind of spend a little less time in the traditional role and a little more time in that research, teaching, and writing role. And then over time, and COVID actually pushed me straight up into all 100% um, virtual because I was already practically there. Um, and so it's been a really great move for me because I have been able to connect with over, I don't know, 600 school psychologists have gone through my course and community to date, which means that's 600 different districts, 600 different perspectives on how we can do this thing called school psychology in a way that's beyond what we've been traditionally put in. And look, it's not anything wrong with our, our, um, you know, our profession. It's really, the resources and the resource allocation problem, which as our education resources dwindle, our mental health resources dwindle. And I think with COVID, actually, there's been a huge opportunity. And that opportunity is people are really starting to see us as more than just testers because our kids need us to be more than just testers. Right. I mean, just to be mental health support and clinicians in the building instead of like special education gatekeepers. And you may have mentioned some of this already, but what would you say is the most rewarding and the most challenging part of being a school psychologist, like a traditional school psychologist? Oh my God, it's 100% the kids. It's a, a, a day without, I think it's, um, 
there's a, a quote, is it Charles, um, Charles Bartlett? Is that his name? Charles Bar Barrett. Barrett, yes, mm -hmm. sorry, I knew that was right. It was like a day without seeing kids is like a wasted day or something like that. Like 100%. The kids are amazing. And school psychs out there, even if you're in a traditional testing role, you cannot underestimate how powerful it is to be that positive person that the kid interacts with. You don't even know the impact you have. Now that I've been in the field 20 years and kids have come up to me, like, and they're adults now, and I don't recognize them. You don't always get to see the impact you have, but the very best part is having that warm interaction with a kid and knowing that you're part of something really big, which is being a loving, connecting, supportive figure in a kid's life. Even briefly, it makes a huge impact. And I love telling the story of, I was walking down the streets of San Francisco years years after I'd been at a particular high school and this kids in this sort of like group of really like kind of tough looking guys, like, you know, tats and all this, they come up, they're like, Hey, <laughs> you're the lady who put me in special ed. And I was like, Oh, I'm like, how's this going to go? Right. And he's like, thank you. And he ran up and this big burly dude gives me this hug. And he's like, I thought I was dumb. I needed that. I finally understood how I learned. And special education was so much easier for me to learn. I'm like, I'm crying on the streets of San Francisco because like, who knew? I just tested this kid. But it really changed this kid's trajectory. So that is the very best part about being a school psychologist is knowing you can be that um, person who makes a difference in a kid's life. It's just magic. Um, the challenging part, I would say, depends on what stage you're in as a school psychologist. In the early stages, I would say it's the biggest challenge is organization, um, efficiency, learning the bureaucratic ropes and all those unwritten rules. Um, and then I feel like school psychologists will kind of get in a rhythm five, six years in. And then the challenge is how, okay, I got my hands on the like organizational piece of it, um, but I still have way more testing than time and I wanna be preventative. So it's sort of reimagining your role. And then later school psychologists, if you haven't figured out a way to do more than just testing or and you know finding those passion projects, in your later years as a school psychologist, it's really, I think, about becoming the sage and finding ways to give back to the school psych community because it can be hard. It's a long haul. And actually, to write the School Psychologist Survival Guide, I interviewed school psychologists who've been in the field 30 plus years. And I asked them, how? Why? Like, at that point, I was so burnt out. I didn't understand like, that you could even do such a thing. Um, and so it really changes what's the most challenging and the, the danger is if you don't recognize this is a common challenge and you will get through it you'll leave the profession before you get to be in this like wonderful rich rewarding experience of being a change maker and helping kids and doing more than testing and being a force for um mental health and learning supports that kids deserve in your school but you've got to move through those common hurdles. So I love how you broke that down into different stages. And I see way too many times like on Facebook or social media, people just complaining about their jobs. And you know, they've had it and they've only been in the field for a couple years. And they're looking for an out. And some people will go back to grad school, some people will I, I don't know, they, they just find something else because they feel like they can't do it anymore. So what are the most common burnout traps for school psychologists? Yeah, I know. And you're spot on. I went to, when I went to NASP, you know, in the before times when you could like meet with human people and like enjoy a coffee with a COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing um, on the program, it was like alternative careers to being a school psychologist was like one of the things, which is a fine thing to, you know, some sort of, you know, um, breakout session. And there was interns in there. They were already looking for their escape hatch before they even entered the profession. 
Um, and that's a problem. And that is like a PR problem. Like I'm here to be like school psychologist, biggest freaking cheerleader on the planet. Because if you move through these common burnout traps, you recognize them, you can walk around them to get to the rewarding parts of the job. You shouldn't have to just suffer through stuff to get to the good stuff, which is being with the kids and being a change agent. There are four common burnout traps that school psychologists can fall into. And they're outlined in my newest book, which I'm really excited about, is The Thriving School Psychologist here. Um, and in fact, in anticipation of this call, I brought a prop <laughs> to illustrate. Um, it is Hermione's Time Turner. Okay, so if you're a Harry Potter person, you know that Hermione turns back time, and this is a time turner. And there is a chapter in my book that is literally called <laughs> Jump in the Time Machine with me. And it's three different points in my career in which I wish I could, even with, I don't know if you've seen the Back to the Future movies, but like, where like Doc Brown gets in the um, time machine and he runs back and he's like, I've got an important message for you. Like I would run back to myself at my internship year, five years in and, even, and then 10 years in and give myself advice about how to move through those burnout traps. So that's all in here. Um, but I know that you have a lot of newbies um, in your group. So I would love to share about um, what it is that you're at risk for when you first start out um, and how you can move past it. So, you know, there's various points in my career in which, you know, I thought about exiting the profession and, and it really was very early on. Um, one of the biggest things I think I would give um, myself advice if I could go back in time about how to prevent burnout. And good news is you don't have to have a time turner, like no time turner required. Here it is for you. There's a couple of things. One is do not be afraid to ask for help. Do not be afraid to say, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. We have this imposter syndrome as newbie psychs, newbie psychs, no, I can't stop seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> Where we're like, oh, you know, I'm like real time now, I gotta figure it out and I gotta know all the answers and all this stuff. Look, I've been in it 20 years, I don't know all the answers. You know what I do? I talk to my Thriving School Psych Collective. I'm like, hey, we have this case. It's really tricky. What do you think? Even seasoned pros ask for help. We're always learning. It's not a sign of weakness or vulnerability. It's a sign of strength. And I know, as now I've been a supervisor of school psychs, I would much rather school psychs come to me like, I don't know what to do here, than to try to pretend like they do and then make some mistake. So first off is don't be afraid to ask for advice. And this is something my intern supervisor told me. She's like, I don't care how small it is, how dumb it sounds, you ask me. And that's huge. So I don't know if you've had that experience of having a um, supervisor who is open to you not knowing the answers. Um, but that is huge. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, I think, is just understand that it's going to get better. And I know when you first start out, it's overwhelming. If the learning curve is like that, <laughs> it is huge. There's so many moving parts. And so just like in grad school, when you have colleagues and friends to talk to about, oh, I need help with this, like you need to have a community of school psychs who you can talk to and lean on and get support from. So don't be afraid to reach out to seasoned school psychs in your district. And the organization piece is what a lot of newbie psychs focus on. I just need to get organized, I need to get efficient. That is one component. But one of the things I mentioned in my book that I think not everyone gets right away is you're actually not one Excel spreadsheet away from success. <laughs> Unfortunately, like if, if organization alone was going to save you, I mean, a lot of people in grad school are very organized, right? Organization, I, I pride myself. I think I have mad executive functioning skills. Like I have a post-it collection down here that's like, won't quit. I've written books on executive functioning. Like I, I am very organized. But in those first couple years, 
I, I felt at sea. I felt like I had to work every weekend because organization alone isn't the only thing. So there's four pillars of thriving school psychologists and organization is one very big, important one, but it's not the only one. There's other things that you need to do to support yourself and it includes having a school psych community, understanding the science of burnout and how to think preventatively and to figure out how to put out, not just like put out fires all day at your school, but to look at the wiring, like why so many fires? Thinking strategically. Those are all the things I outline in my book. But I think it's so important for newbie psychs to understand that what you're going through is normal and there's a, a pathway. So you just got to keep walking that pathway because the risk is, like you said, that you might exit the field too soon and then you don't get to reap the rewards of this like amazing career. So what is one piece of advice you would give to a first year psychologist? I would say that in addition to what I've already mentioned, it's to have mantras that you can fall back on when you're in moments of stress and you don't know the answer and you feel like you should or all the eyeballs are on you at that IEP meeting and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> Everything is figure outable. Maybe not in that exact moment, but you can say, that is a fabulous question. I don't know the answer to that right now. Or I want to give that question the amount of careful thought it deserves because it's a complex one. I will help figure this out. And I think that's a shift that I wish I had known starting out, which is you don't have to have the answer on the spot. And even seasoned professionals don't have answers on the spot and it's okay. Everything is figure outable. The other piece of advice <laughs> I would have, and this is a, I'm going to project on all you all. I'm sure you have beautiful, healthy work-life boundaries and you shut it down and you know, you can mentally relax. I was not one of those people. I was one of those people who I spent the first at least 10 years of my career working every night, every weekend. And as I mentioned earlier, I was on that fast track to burnout. I felt like I had to. I was like, well, there's deadlines. You have to. And now I know I had my time turner. <laughs> I would tell myself that rested, happy minds are more productive. Meaning if you take that break, if you take that weekend, you're going to be more productive on Monday to tackle that report that you need to write. It's that mantra that's gotten me through those, like looking at the work bag on Friday afternoon, being like, should I, shouldn't I, should I? And then you end up bringing it home and then you don't do it and then you feel guilty and it's this back and forth. Rested, happy minds are more productive. It will keep you from looking back 20 years and being like, oh my gosh, what I wouldn't have done now for like a kid-free brunch. Like I... <laughs> squandered so many kid-free brunch moments when I lived in San Francisco and I was footloose and fancy-free. Um, I love my kids. I would give one kidney to one and a kidney to the other and die for them. But like, man, there's something about like a kid-free brunch that, uh, you know, it would be great. <laughs> um, and so I don't want school psych is a part of who you are. And I made it all of who I was all in because I was so passionate. And that's why I thought I was going to be immune from burnout because I loved it. But burnout doesn't always look like disengagement. It can look like over engagement for school psychs and helping professionals. I think you can be passionate and love what you do and still need a break from it so that you can come back and do it again and do it well. So I think that that is amazing advice and I, something I'm working on right now and I'm sure, you know, I'll be working on in the next couple of years, work-life balance and the because there's just so many reports. <laughs> yeah, so, so much, much and something that you nailed it. If you can nail this out of the shoot in your first couple of years as a school psychologist and be able to deal with the bureaucratic pushback of others working is a culture, right? It's a culture of we do everything for the kids and at all costs. And that's not sustainable. 
And so if you out of the shoot as a newbie psych can have those healthy work-life boundaries and feel okay with that muddy, uncomfortable feeling of saying, no, I'm not going to bring home unpaid work, then you're setting yourself up for success, a long and healthy and wonderful career, because you're not going to be like me, burnt out and wanting to quit, even though you loved it. This year was very tough, though, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people felt it, like with COVID, all the changes, like all teachers, students, psychologists, everyone. Hopefully, everything that we talked about today will help, you know, current grad students, early career psychs, and even people who have been in the profession for a long time. I want to take this time to plug in a really cool quiz that you told me about, a quiz to identify your burnout trap and how to tackle them. So I will leave that in the description box below. Please go and check it out. Is that free? It's totally free. So you'll just type in, there's 10 questions and it will let you know what your personalized burnout trap is. And because I love you all, I would never leave you in a burnout trap. The point is to identify it so that you can avoid it or get out of it. And so there's a free video training that's personalized and a free um, downloadable printable of what you can do if you feel like you're stuck in that burnout trap or you're headed for it. Because I don't want any of y'all to be blindsided like I was. And so these are the four most common burnout traps. And then I also provide the antidote. <laughs> so I would never leave you in a burnout trap. It's totally free and it's a free training um, that you will get a personalized video from me after you get your results about what you can do about it. And I'm all about being practical. I'm about making recommendations really specific to school psychologists' lives because I've been you. I am you. I've been in it for 20 years and I know these mental roadblocks. And not only that, but it's not just like my idea and what worked for Rebecca, because it did. Um, these strategies that you'll learn from the burnout quiz have been tried and tested by over 600 school psychologists in my online course and community. So I started like inadvertently, first I started out just wanting to have connection and collaboration. And what I inadvertently created was like a real life laboratory of these principles. Like, do they really work? And I've been just blown away by the school psychologists who email me and say, I was going to quit. And I was just a testing machine and I hated it. And I was resenting everybody. And now I can't wait to go to work again. I feel renewed. I feel refreshed. I feel like this has been a game changer. And there's nothing that makes me happier because we know there's a shortage of school psychologists. And if people are bouncing out in the year ones, two, three, four, five, they are going to miss out on all the wonderful things that we have to offer kids and families and our school communities we serve. It's, I know that NASP is doing some brilliant work as well on advocating for lower caseloads. And I'm here to tell you, when school psychs thrive, kids thrive, communities thrive. There's so much impact you can make in the world. And I know you newbie psychs out there have a big dream. You have a passion project deep inside you. You're like, I need to get this passion project out. I really want to help. And if you can move past these four common burnout traps, the sky's the limit. And I'm really excited about this new generation of school psychologists coming into the field. Y'all are energized and motivated and thoughtful. And um, I just love the energy that y'all bring to the profession. Yeah, there's a lot of us. We're very excited. We're very hungry. <laughs> And yeah, we're ready. So um, you're so awesome. You're a rock star. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This has been an incredible time. I've loved talking with you. All right. And I know you're on social media and you have a website. You have so much going on. I'm going to leave all of it on the screen and in the description box. Please go and check her out. She's an amazing resource, amazing human. And I will see you guys in the next one. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.